mysterious story of Baba Vanga began during the second half of the 20th century in a small isolated village of Bulgaria. Raised in the midst of poverty, suffering from complete blindness, Baba Vanga started seeing visions of the future at a very young age, though to be very disturbing by those who were closest to her. But it was not until much later that her popularity reached its peak throughout the Soviet Union. Eventually, when heads of states would consult her for both political and personal matters, however, the predictions of the Nostradamus of the Balkans would become more and more disturbing with the fall of the USSR. Beyond the Slavic legend, who was Baba Vanga really? Was she a mystic, a superstitious peasant, who was manipulated by the Politburo, or merely a woman born with the unique gift of clairvoyance? Join us on a trip together through the troubled and turbulent history of this region of the world where local superstition combined with life's daily difficulties gave birth to one of its most famous figures. The story begins in 1911, in the village of Salonika, which is currently located in North Macedonia. At the time, the territory as a whole had been under the domain of the Ottoman Empire since 1867. The Ottoman Empire, which had once been quite powerful, was now in its final glory days. In Istanbul, the government's coffers were almost empty, the foreign debt was exorbitant and the empire was finding it difficult to repay. Ethnic conflicts occurred between Christians and Muslims every day. In addition, there was also the growing threat from the local scholarly elite, those who would study in Europe and would subsequently return with an outlook that was quite different from the one that they had when they left Turkey, with their red fez hats on their heads and souls were still pure. Their parents must have thought that it was a serious mistake to have sent them off to non-believing heretics because now they had to bribe everyone to find their children, senior government positions, as well as suitable partners to marry. For the sultan and his entourage, it was out of the question to give in and bend to the will of Europe. It was inconceivable to change any of their habits now. If the state had run out of money, then they would simply borrow more or double the tax on income, even if it meant inventing new tax labs or extracting money from northern Africa, Algeria or Egypt. In short, a weakened political and socio-cultural balance meant that the next worldwide conflict would eventually bring them to their knees. However, let's leave those concerns aside for the moment and instead return to the small Macedonian village where our story began. Salonika, which has been renamed Stromica by the Janissaries, was no longer really part of Europe, but rather a crossroad between the East and the West. While the bells of the local Orthodox chapel continue to ring on Sundays, the bazaars, mosques, fortresses and caravans coming from Asia Minor and Maghreb during the religious festivals were a reminder that the Turkish presence was nothing more than an illusion. Here, several different ethnic groups had coexisted for quite some time, including Macedonians, Albanians, Greeks, Serbs, Croats, Bosnians, Bulgarians, and the Armenians. While they initially all lived secluded in the mountains, guarded by the traditions and customs through vendettas and honor crimes, others lived more peacefully in the harbor town and worked as traders, craftsmen, and merchants in bazaars. On these market back streets that looked like the interior of a marvelous cave, the rough tones of the Slavs mixed with the softer and more musical-oriental languages. All negotiations and haggling were done in a common language, Serbo-Croatian, which was understood by everyone and integrated into the merchant's charter. Despite the existence of an apparent cultural melting pot, everyone held to their traditions, stayed in their communities, and ensured the preservation of their own identity. Therefore, it was rare to have marriages between people of different backgrounds. The rule of keeping to oneself had never been more obvious and more important than in this part of the world. It was January 31, 1911, shortly after the Orthodox Christmas celebrations, that a little girl was born in one of the rural homes of the region. The baby was born prematurely. In keeping with the Orthodox Church's traditions, she was not given a first name or last name as long as her prognosis was still determined. But one week went by, and then two, and the little girl survived the greatest relief of her parents. The Pope came to bless her in person, and she was eventually baptized. She was given the name Evangelia Pandeva. 
Her parents, Panda Surchev and Paraskeva Surcheva, welcomed her birth as a miracle, especially because everything had indicated that she would not survive her first 48 hours. In an era when infant mortality rates were quite high, it was not unusual that infant-sized coffins were already made before they were even born. Pandor Sorchev was a soldier and opposed the current Ottoman regime. His wife, Paraskeva, was like most women, a wife and mother who took care of home. They both came from poor Macedonian families that had migrated from the mountains. Evangela, who was soon nicknamed Vanga, an affection diminutive for little Evangeline, spent her childhood in the mountainous region of Rupert, which bordered on Bulgaria. She was a little blonde girl with very expressive brown eyes. Like all children born into the farming community, she was quickly initiated into household chores and other more burdensome work required in the countryside. When she was barely seven years old, Vanga lost her mother following a tuberculosis outbreak. At the time, Macedonia was under the control of Bulgaria before being incorporated during the First World War into the Serbian, Croatian and Slovenian kingdom in what would become future Yugoslavia. After the premature death of her mother, Vanga had no other choice but to take over her duties and become a substitute mother figure for her father Pando, who remained widowed and lonely. Vanga had not been educated since her father believed that she didn't need it. Preparing to become a wife and learning how to maintain a house was all that she needed to know. For this former peasant, with old-fashioned ideas, education could only harm a girl by making her disobedient by putting strange ideas into her head. Pando Surchev was a hothead. When he did not tyrannically rule over his household, he spent his time organizing secret meetings, handing out leaflets, and calling for his fellow citizens to rebel against the Bulgars, who had just taken over Macedonia after the Turks had retreated. Macedonia for Macedonians. He would chat in the taverns. A fight was never far away. Consequently, he was arrested by the authorities and thrown in the prison. His family's possessions were confiscated by the authorities and overnight, Vanga was forced to fend for herself and survive on her neighbor's charity. Panda Surchev was eventually released a year later. He used a matchmaker to find himself a new wife. She presented him with Palmenera, a Greek seamstress who had already been rejected by two previous suitors due to her polio-stricken leg. The stepmother was a hard and relentless woman. Vanga did not like her, but was nevertheless forced to put up with her to please her father. Pando and Palmenera had three other children, a son Marco and two other little girls, Androma and Haristina. To her younger brother and sister, Vanga became a kind of second mother, taking care of them with a lot of love and attention. The lonely child was ostracized by her family and often treated as a servant as soon as she developed a secret language that she called the language of plants and animals. On more than one occasion, she was seen talking to flowers. Her stepmother treated her as if she was crazy and even threatened to have her institutionalized if she insisted on continuing with her foolishness. But Vanga took it all very seriously and swore that she would be understood by other living beings. Between 1922 and 1924, a series of tragedies rocked the family. Panda Sergev died first, followed by his wife two years later. At just 14 years old, Vanga Sergeva found herself as the head of a family of minor children. Times were hard. The First World War had left material and human ravages and plunged the country into chaos from which it was painfully trying to rebuild itself. As the eldest sister, Vaga was forced to work as a housekeeper in order to provide for the needs of her siblings. In her absence, she knew that she could also count on the support of her neighbors who sympathized with her misfortune. It was around this time when strange things first started to happen. Life in Scotch was dramatically different than in the village. In the city, women walked around with their heads uncovered, even the Muslims, they smoked, drank, and wore skirts that revealed the shape of their plum calves in flesh-colored stockings, which were much too short for the local sensibilities. As soon as she started working for her new employers, Vanga was ordered to remove her headscarf and to get rid of the potato sack that she called a dress. In its place, she was provided with a black uniform and a matching headdress. But her troubles had only just begun. Her blonde hair, which reached her lower back, was cut off by her employer in order to prevent an outbreak of lice. She cried for hours over her new tomboyish haircut and generated contempt from her employer, who herself sported a head full of short, dyed curls. Maids must never wear glasses. Only governesses are permitted to wear them. Vanga had already been experiencing eye problems for quite some time. First the left one, then the right. A doctor diagnosed her having an inflamed cornea and prescribed salt baths to clean her scars every day. However, her condition did not improve, but instead worsened. 
In the kitchen, Vanga began breaking plates due to her carelessness. Her employer was quite angry when she found out and threatened not to pay her. On her maid's bed, Vanga shed angry tears over the eyesight that had started to fail her and a life that seemed to work against her. First her mother, then her father, and then Palmonera. If the children didn't get anything to eat this week, the Pope would order that all three of them be placed in an orphanage. She cried so much that she soaked her pillow before finally exhausted, she fell into a deep sleep. When she awoke the next day, Vanga noticed that she had still her black uniform and white apron, but her headdress had disappeared. Everything around her seemed brighter, like the dim light of an early spring morning. Vanga realized that she was no longer in her employer's house, but actually in a field of golden, ripe and wheat-like at harvest time, while in Scotch, it was the middle of winter. How did she get there? She felt a profound sense of well-being taking over her that lifted her off the ground. Astral traveling was something that Vanga had never experienced before. When she returned to her employer's house, she was immediately arrested on her doorstep by the butler. She was later fired by her bosses. Apparently, it had been more than 10 days since she had left and so her employers had sent a police patrol to look out for her in town. The vision of the chimeric field of wheat must have lasted longer than she realized. With no job in hand and no income, Vanga sadly returned to the village of Rupit. A teacher's wife was so moved by Vanga's situation that she agreed to take her on as a housekeeper for a paltry salary. People in my situation aren't allowed to say no. A year later, Vanga lost her sight completely, but according to official sources, she probably lost it well before these events, most likely on a stormy day that would have kicked up a significant amount of dust. The sand would have entered the eye sockets and caused a serious infection. Since it was not treated in time, it led to gradual blindness that later became permanent. Since she was unable to pay her adequately, the village teacher eventually found her a place in a school in Zemun for blind children in what is currently Belgrade, where she learned to read and write Russian braille as well as math and piano. She remained there for three years. This day also allowed her to develop other skills that allowed her to function independently, such as learning how to wash and dress, do housework, light the fireplace and prepare meals without needing assistance from anyone else. Regretfully, she left the school and returned to her mountain village. Second World War, 1939 Her blindness helped heighten her other senses, especially her hearing. Seated on a chair on her doorstep, Vanga was shelling little peas. The rolling of another chair in front of her, in which her neighbor sat down heavily, made her lift her head. You sit differently. Your husband Mirko grabs a chair in one fell swoop and places it so as to have one leg against the side of the wall. About a grandmother drags it right beside me without making a sound, but I always know it's her. Her neighbor exclaimed with admiration. Personally, I would not be able to tell which of us did this or that. A week later, the two women learned that the able-bodied men and Rupit were required to enlist. Another global conflict was just about to begin. If required, even teenagers would be inducted. After the men went off, Rupert became a kind of open-air prison where, due to circumstances, a matriarchal community now coexisted with the children and the elderly, all united in their sorrows, all fearing the monthly mail delivery announcing the soldiers who had fallen in combat. Vanga found out that her younger brother Marco was with his squad somewhere in northern Italy, safe and sound. She saw him in a dream, or rather, she was already awake. A few days later, Marco Eliu, her next-door neighbor, appeared in her dream with a chicken egg in one hand and a shroud in the other. His family learned that he had been killed by enemy fire. Before every deadline, Vanga immediately started listing the names of village soldiers who had fallen in the trenches, already preparing their respective families to start grieving. One night, the spirit of Mirko Eliu came to beg her to write a letter to his grieving wife. With that paper or pen, Vanga asked him to verbally dictate the message that he wanted to send his wife and she would take care of the rest. The next day, late at night, she sent for her neighbor, made coffee, went into a trance and spoke to her in the voice of her late husband. In 1941, Nazi troops had just invaded Yugoslavia. In the village of Rupert, rumblings of combat slowly began to be heard but no one was yet aware that the Germans had already set foot on their soil. One evening, as she was getting ready for bed, Vanga had a strange sensation come over her. She could no longer sleep. The next day, she said to one of her young sisters, The light horsemen are coming. By that, she meant Hitler's troops. 
Soon the news spread through the village like wildfire. The villagers panicked at the thought of seeing their homes turn into a battle headquarters and started to hide food in underground tarps. The villagers knew only too well that pillaging was one of the scourges of war. There could be months of famine if the enemy soldiers came and absconded with all their supplies. A few days later, one of the villagers gave the alert that an army of soldiers returning from the battlefield was marching towards Rupert. A response was quickly being prepared. These were Bulgarian soldiers, not mercenaries or reformers, but rather the wounded with gaunt faces. They were an army dressed in rags, their bodies shivered by malnutrition and ravaged by vermin from the trenches. Among them was Dimitar Kushterov. He was gravely injured in the leg by a bayonet. Vanga was sent to care for him. She knew how to skillfully use medicinal herbs and had already taken care of the residents in her village in the past. They talked to each other in Serbian. The only language that they both spoke, Dimitar Kushterov's recovery, was spent at the Sir Chef's home. When his strength returned, he discovered that he was moved by this blind young woman with a nimble gait who darted around the house to fix his meals without ever knocking over a chair or spilling a container, who cooked, sewed, and did embroidery without needing any assistance. The young soldier was surprised to see such a young person hiding behind such shabby clothes. Without a hint of flirtatiousness, her hair hidden under a scarf with white tassels and a St. Basil cross around her neck. Ever since she had lost her sight, Vanga got into the habit of closing her eyes at all times. As a result, they became narrower and turned into two deep slots without a socket. When he was barely back on his feet, Dimitar Gusterov asked Evangelia to marry him. The young woman had never been courted by anyone and was surprised by his offer, but eventually accepted. She gave him the affectionate nickname of Mitya. On May 10, 1942, they were married in the Little Orthodox Chapel in Surmika, and then the couple moved to Petrik in Bulgaria, where the young man was born. Their honeymoon was short since the husband had to go back to the front after his leave was over. As he held Vanga, Dimitar promised her that he would come back soon. She knew that he would return. Although she came from Macedonia, Vanga immediately fit into her adopted country. Her blindness provoked compassion as well as admiration from the residents of Petrik. Every day Vanga woke at dawn adhering to the old rural habit that forbade sleeping in. That was a scourge of the urban middle class, including her former employers in Skop, who were frequent practitioners and often had breakfast in bed. Her simple and practical rural upbringing was never really made for taking such luxuries. Throughout the whole day, she could not sit still. She drew water from the well, milked the two little cows that were inherited from her husband's parents, fed the chickens, and swept every surface where dust was likely to gather. With her hands on her walking stick, she went twice a week to the chapel to light a candle to pray that her husband would be protected by a divine hand. She knew the route from her modest cottage to the dome of St. Mikhail by heart. During the spring of 1944, Laszlo, a child shepherd, did not return with the rest of his herd from the mountains. Search parties were organized by volunteers from the village to look for the little boy. They looked for days, but their efforts were in vain. Their search turned up nothing. Then one evening, Vanga declared, Laszlo will not be coming back. The wolves have devoured him. Wolves of the worst species. He came to see me in my sleep. He was calling out for his mother. The missing child's parents soon found out about Vanga's horrible premonitions. She was able to show them the way to the body. And so, in her bare feet and her night dress, she traveled through the forest followed by everyone in the village until she came to a pit hidden by some branches. It was there that the child's remains were found. He had been sexually assaulted and brutally murdered by a vagabond lurking in the area. His flock was later found scattered across the Romanian border area a few weeks later. After the funeral for the young shepherd, rumors began to circulate about Dimitar's wife. They believed she was a prophet who had been given the gift of clairvoyance by some divine or supernatural force. For these simple and superstitious people, it was obvious that God had taken away her sight in order to give her something even more precious, the gift of being able to predict the future. From then on, her popularity grew constantly. Not only did the villagers visit her home to buy medicinal herbs that were supposed to cure coughs, fevers, rashes, nausea, and miscarriages, but men also came for other reasons that were clearly more urgent. I put 10 dinars on a horse named Bogdan. Will he win Saturday's race, Vanga Gusterova? Bogdan is in no condition to run. Better keep your money for colt number five. He has wings. At the end of the war, as the survivors began returning home, Vanga and her husband built a small house in the hopes of starting a family. But no children ever came, probably due to her husband's alleged sterility, which at the time was considered taboo. 
In addition to their problems conceiving, the relationship between Vanga and Dimitar began to deteriorate largely due to his alcoholism and brutality towards her. Continually outraged, Mattia now looked for an excuse to bully her mercilessly. Make me a cup of strong coffee and bring it to me on the porch. Hurry up. He grimaced. He didn't like the coffee that she had prepared. Furious, he threw the cup in his wife's face as she froze in fear. Instinctively, she stepped back into the kitchen as far as she could and covered her head with her arms. That was what happened to Mattia when he started drinking for several days in a row. He was no longer himself. You call that making coffee? What did you put into it, you viper? I made the coffee like I always do. What are you trying to do, poison me? Here, go get my cigarettes. I must be crazy to talk to an idiot like you who can't even get me a child. Vanga was deeply hurt by these accusations. When he eventually slammed the door and left, she began to cry, weeping the slits of her sightless eye with the ends of her embroidered apron. Their relationship was on the rocks, and the love they had during the first year of their marriage gave way to a dull resentment that Timitar thought about all day long. They kept their distance from one another, but continued to share the same house and the same bed. Sometimes when he was a bit drunk, Mattia gave her an awkward hug and asked her to forgive him before reverting back to his old ways the very next day. In the rural setting of the era, getting a divorce was simply not done and Vanga did not even consider it. There came a time when Dimitar left for Greece where he was tortured for days before being sent to a work camp in the northern part of the island as a result of his anti-communist activities. When he returned to Petrick, he once again descended into alcoholism and eventually died of a stomach ulcer in 1962. Widowed and childless, Wanga decided to wear mourning clothes permanently and confined herself at home. She said she wanted peace in order to be able to calmly speak with the spirit of Mitya, who came every night to beg for her forgiveness. In the communist Yugoslavia of the 1960s, there was no place for prophets of her caliber who continue to secretly pray to God that the political system had removed from its constitution. The churches were now closed and the popes had long ago traded in their patriarchal beards for those of the devoted communist atheists. All religious festivals were now forbidden, including Christmas. On New Year's Day, the government distributed food baskets to the entire population. However, the rest of the time, they had a lineup for almost everything. Meat, bread, milk, firewood, socks, sugar, and cigarettes. During the fall of 1963, when she went out to water the plants underneath the porch of her house, Vanga could hear the sound of a motorcade of cars in the distance. She knew that no one in Petrick owned a car. The sound of tires grew closer and closer. There were five of them, five shiny black Volgas. The Volga remained motionless. They had come for her. Two tall men in double-breasted suits invited her inside the last vehicle. She asked them to go get her scarf first, since she never left the house with her head uncovered. When she returned, eyes staring into space, awaited their decision, they spoke to her in Russian. Do you know why we have come to see you, Babata? Grandmother. Yes, to take me to a large house surrounded by a white wall, where it is warm all winter, and where I will eat meat with every meal. The two Secret Service agents looked at each other incredulously. A third agent sitting in the passenger seat gave the driver the sign to start the car. The motorcade began driving away. A few neighbors who were too frightened to step outside watched the whole scene from behind their windows with their shades tightly drawn. Why were they taking the blind grandmother away? She had never left the house since the death of her husband. Sandwiched between the shoulders of two men who had just lit their cigarettes, Baba Vanga was now heading off to her new destiny, that of a government agent. The motorcade arrived in its destination late that afternoon. Two white black doors opened before them. Vanga heard the squealing of tires on the gravel. Everyone got out as she was almost pulled from the car. All around her, she could hear people speaking in a mixture of Bulgarian and Russian. This was the government's large Stalinian estate, painted white with very impressive Roman columns. Passing from one arm to another, Vanga was taken down an endless flight of stairs which led to a hall bath in an electric yellow light. She was then entrusted to a Russian chambermaid with almost Herculean strength who practically lifted her off the ground and took her for a bath. Her baptismal locket was confiscated. She was given a new black dress and fed a meal of soup, poached potatoes, and caviar. Later that night, she received a visit from one of the agents who came to pick her up in her village of Petrick. We'll let you sleep now, Babata. Tomorrow you'll be introduced to someone very important. The next day, Baba Vanga was escorted to a hall on the ground floor where the doors closed behind her. 
A strong smell of Turkish tobacco, like her father Pando used to smoke, overwhelmed her nostrils. Seated behind a desk, a man in his fifties with dark, bushy eyebrows and hair of the same color greeted her, hello in a drawing, monotone voice. Leonid Illich, exclaimed the mystic. Indeed, it was Leonid Bershnev in person, recently promoted as the Secretary General of the Communist Party of the USSR. Since he and his minions had ousted his predecessor, Nikita Khrushchev, Baba Vanga was called to collaborate in exchange she would be made a senior member of the Institution of Life Sciences. It would be her responsibility to provide him with her visions about the future and she would be consulted regularly for that very reason. The government would act as her guarantor, pay her wages and provide her with house staff at her disposition 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. She was a blind old peasant woman. How could she possibly say no to such an offer? Between 1964 and 1966, Baba Vanga's reputation as an oracle spread throughout the rest of the Soviet bloc. She became the official clairvoyant of the Central Power in Bulgaria. As an honorary member of the party, she made several trips to the socialist republics of Romania, Ukraine, Georgia, and Romania. In Russia, she was even given the nickname of Babushka Vanga, and she was even received at the Kremlin. Yet this sudden fame is not without its drawbacks. She provoked skepticism for many scientists who were looking into her case. The fact that her blindness had triggered her first prophecy became an area of study at the Institute of Parapsychology and Suggestology in Sofia. Her detractors considered her to be a government sellout who took advantage of her disability to lead a life free from any material concerns. The residence in which she was almost permanently assigned was actually close to her village, Petrik, which slowly became a place of inspiration. In addition to political personalities, Baba Vanga offered her services as a medium and clairvoyant for a fee which was then cleverly taxed by the government while they did not actually even spend a penny on her. The secretaries and a personal assistant supported her and also managed the flow of people who came to see her. Her reputation as a prophet now went beyond the Iron Curtain and soon wealthy European and American clients started to come to seek her services. Dignitaries from the Bulgarian government did not hesitate to exploit their golden goose and the wealthy idle clients from the West were charged six times about the normal rate. In the early 1970s, Baba Vanga was granted the status of research associate of the communist government of Bulgaria. She claimed that she was able to read the minds of those who came to consult her and she could even relate what they had experienced since birth and sometimes even when they were in the womb. But what was really the truth behind her predictions? It was clear that during the whole time when she lived at the White House, she was being used and only told dignitaries what they wanted to hear, probably for fear of being reprimanded or severely punished with imprisonment, exile or execution. Some people had even begun to accuse her of having acquired a taste for money and for the ease of life of luxury far from the deprivation that she had known in the past. Folk singer Silviana Armanulik, who was then very popular throughout Yugoslavia, learned of the prophet and felt the need to meet her. She wanted to know if she wished to sign a major contract with a Soviet recording label. That was how she made an appointment and went to Baba Vanga's house. The singer's reception was reserved and cold. The prophet flatly refused to speak with her. Yet the singer was insistent and remained seated next to her, but Vanga persisted in turning her back on her and would not speak to her. Then when the singer least expected it, Vanga turned around quickly and said to her, You don't have to pay anything. I don't want your money. I don't want anything to do with you. Now go and come back in three months. Silviana understood that this was a lost cause and so she took her bag and headed towards the door when Baba Vanga stopped her and said, No, it's impossible. You won't be able to come back in three months. Two months later, the iconic singer died tragically in a car accident. In 1979, while she was being interviewed by the Russian author, Valentin Sidorov, she predicted the electoral victory of a future president. Everything will melt like ice but one man will remain untouched the glory of Vladimir, the glory of Russia. Later on, some people would interpret this as a proof of Vladimir Putin's rise to power. During the winter of 1985, Baba Vanga predicted the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, which occurred a few months later on April 26, 1986. She had spoken of deadly fumes that would spread from Ukraine to Belarus, sweeping away everything in its path. On April 26, 1986, one of the reactors at the Lenin nuclear power plant exploded, releasing a significant amount of radiation and causing one of the worst human and material disasters of the 20th century. 
In 1989, she predicted the tragedy of September 11, 2001 in New York. She said that the American brothers would fall after having been attacked by steel birds. In the early 1990s, Baba predicted upcoming fall of the Soviet Union and breakup of its socialist republics. On December 26, 1991, the Soviet bloc came crashing down, generating one of the most devastating economic crises ever known. Forced to give up her titles and lifestyle to which she had become accustomed, Baba Vanga packed her bags and returned to her rural home in Pitrick. There she resumed her activities as a medium, but this time free of charge, since the economic crisis had dramatically reduced the value of the country's currency and many people saw all their savings disappear overnight. With the reopening of all houses of worship, faithful pilgrims and worshippers erected an Orthodox chapel named St. Petka in Rupit during her lifetime. When she was almost 80 years old, the Nostradamus of the Balkans stated that she wanted to live her final years in seclusion far from earthly possessions. She still continued to have visions, to go into trances, and to communicate with the dead who, according to her, provided her with all the details that she shared. In 1994, she incorrectly predicted that the FIFA Cup championship for that year would be played by two teams whose names started with the letter B. In the end, only one team, Brazil, would be correct as their opponent would be Italy. In 1995, she predicted the re-election of Russian President Boris Yeltsin for a second consecutive mandate in the Kremlin. Two years before her death, Baba Vanga ravaged by breast cancer, refused treatment in a specialized clinic in Sofia. She never left her home and was cared for her by her neighbors. Wearing her usual black dress, white apron, and fringe scarf, she spent her days sitting on a sofa and regularly receiving visits from religious dignitaries traveling from the capital. Her powers of insight remained unchanged and she continued to have visions of the future. In turn, that was how she was able to predict a tsunami that would sweep through Indonesia in 2004. An immense wave would wash over the coast, the cities and their residents would disappear underwater. She also foretold the sinking of the Russian nuclear submarine, the Kirks, which occurred on August 12, 2000. The white Russians would be imprisoned in a steel box, a damp tomb, and the whole world will weep for them. In 1995, she predicted that the 44th President of the United States would be an African-American. In this case, Barack Obama. As with the 45th President, Donald Trump, she stated that he would have to face an overwhelming global crisis. Baba Vanga was also the bearer of good news for her own country, since her predictions of the imminent victory of the Bulgarian chess player Veselin Teplov during the World Chess Tournament in 2005 provided to be correct. As well, she prophesied of an upcoming miracle cure for cancer that would be created using hormones and animal compounds from a ruminant, a canine, and a reptile. Horses are strong, dogs are robust, and turtles live a long time. She also made some predictions that are still in dispute, particularly concerning a third world war between 2010 and 2014, an alleged chemical war in 2011, and the disappearance of the continent of Europe in 2016. In 1996, the oracle whose breast cancer triggered infections in her other organs remained bedridden. She spoke of her upcoming death, which she estimated would take place between August 11 and 13 of that same year. A few months before her death, Baba Vanga claimed that she would be reincarnated in the body of a blind girl living in France. Vanga stated that this girl would be responsible for taking her place. However, it is difficult to determine the merits of this last prophecy or to know the identity of the spiritual successor in question. Baba Vanga died in her home in Petrick on August 11, 1966 as a result of her breast cancer. In accordance with her final wishes, she requested that her house be turned into a museum and dedicated entirely to those who wished to enter it. Her funeral attracted many people from all over Bulgaria, as well as visitors from Macedonia, Serbia, and Russia who came to pay their respects. Her burial ceremony also broadcasted on several local television stations. Among the thousand predictions Baba Vanga had made, about 80% of them proved accurate or actually came true in time. She had, among other things, predicted the Kurdish genocide in Iraq, the events of the Arab Spring in 2010, and the establishment of the next caliphate in the city of Rome. She also declared that there would be a worldwide famine in the year 2073. However, opinions of the Vanga phenomenon are far from unanimous. Some people, such as philosopher Yuri Gorny, defined her in a very unflattering term that were enough to damage the myth built up around her persona. He had this to say about her. 
Baba Vanga was a well-known promoted government enterprise through which the provincial religion, which had been neglected up until now, was transformed into a pilgrimage. Do you know who prayed the most for her after her death? It was the taxi drivers, waiters, hotel staff, the tourist guides, in short, all those who benefited from the stable income as long as things went well. They were the only ones who collected the information on her future clients and brought it to her before her visit. People who visited remained unaware of the deception and really believed that they were dealing with the clairvoyant, but that was not the case. She had been interviewed several times for Bulgarian and Russian television. Sir Gui Medvedev, press secretary of President Yeltsin, was one of the most faithful followers. A documentary which filmed her in real time in her little village of Fetrik was produced shortly before her death. The prophetess was followed as she went about her daily routine and during her prediction sessions where she was asked a random question by a hand-picked audience. In compliance with her last wishes, her museum house was eventually opened to visitors in 2008. As for the chapel that was built during her lifetime, it continues to attract pilgrims from all over the former Yugoslavia. Baba Vanga had learned to read Braille, but she had never written nor published any books during her lifetime. After her death, a few esoteric and homeopathic collections have been published about her, in particular, a biography by Rina entitled Baba Vanga, the 20th century's greatest medium, as well as Baba Vanga's natural remedies, the power of wild plants. Their content has long been a source of debate since the authors relied solely on rumors and had never met her during her lifetime. Many of her admirers have expressed their desires to see her canonized as a full-fledged saint of the Orthodox Church. A decision on this matter has not yet been made. The story of the Bulgarian prophet, which had long been kept a state secret hidden behind the Iron Curtain, had only recently reached the West and the rest of the world. In fact, one of her final predictions concerned the end of the world, which she announced for the year 5070, as well as an extraterrestrial invasion. We're at the end of our show for today. So feel free to listen to the other shows on the podcast and take five seconds to leave us a five-star rating on iTunes. It's really important to us. You can also subscribe to the next episodes and follow us on Facebook to suggest new ones. Thank you and see you soon.